The Maple Leafs lost to St. Louis on Saturday night, but it was quickly forgotten as Toronto made a trade getting rid of uh, Nick Ritchie and adding to the team's death. We'll break down all of that more on today's edition of Locked on Leafs. <laughs> Your Locked On Maple Leafs, your daily podcast on the Toronto Maple Leafs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome into the Locked On Leafs podcast, one-stop shop for all things Leafs. I'm your host, Mike DiStefano from TSN 1050 Toronto Radio, also known as Al's brother from TSN's Overdrive and TSN 1050's Leafs Lunch. With me, my permanent co-host of the show, it's Dave Morissuti from Sportsnet and a writer for the NHLPA. And just a reminder that this is a daily Maple Leaf-centric podcast, so be sure to subscribe to the show for free wherever you get your podcast. You can also check us out now up on YouTube. So go check it out, uh, Locked on Leafs. And today's episode is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online, it's where the game starts. Dave, we got uh, this is this is the the fun season has begun. The fun season has begun. I love trade season, and it's really starting to seem real. We had our first Maple Leafs deal come down over the weekend. Uh, Kyle Dubas making a trade just an hour or so after the final between the St. Louis Blues. So we'll break down both of those situations. But I think the trade's a little bit more uh, prominent at this point for for us and. For our listeners here at Locked On Leafs. So why don't we just go ahead. So here's how, what the trade was. Uh, the Toronto Maple Leafs traded Nick Ritchie for a conditional 2022 third round pick, which uh, Arizona has the opportunity to, I guess, convert it to a 2025 second round pick. If they would like to, they'll have up until that pick um, is selected in 2023 technically. So if there's a player, if there's not a player that they want there, they can convert it to a second three years down the road. And that's what they may want to do there. But that is the trade. Uh, that's what Toronto sent out. Incoming for the Maple Leafs, Ilya Lebushkin and Ryan Dezingle, both of these guys pending UFAs. Um, Dave, I guess before I kind of break it down and go into these players specifically, what were your initial thoughts on the deal? I mean, just if you're called Dubas, you just got a monkey or even a gorilla size uh, relief, you know, getting Nick Ritchie's deal off the off the table. Like that's the first thing you see is you notice that not only is he off for this season, but also next season. Yeah, that's and that's exactly what this deal does. We'll, we'll go over the cap ramifications of this deal in in just a moment. But why don't we break down exactly what Toronto is getting as part of this trade, because I think it was quite the tidy piece of work. I mean, Nick Ritchie didn't have a future here in Toronto. It, it They gave it a shot. They tried, and it just didn't work. And he was buried in the minors, and that money was kind of costing this team a little bit. And they were able to find a taker for his contract. They gave a little bit of a sweetener and a draft pick and actually got some decent pieces back. So Ryan Dezingles, the Ford, that's coming back. You probably do know that name. He did spend some time with the Ottawa Senators in the past. Uh, two-time 20-goal scorer can kind of play up and down your lineup, has some playoff experience. He was actually part of the Blue Jackets team, if you remember, that beat the Tampa Bay Lightning a few years back when they upset them before Tampa then went on to win the Cup the, the next two seasons. But um, they were part of that. Uh, he was part of that run. But here's the thing with Ryan Dezingle. So he only makes $1.1 million, so his contract is fully variable. And I think I heard today that they plan to send him straight down to the minors anyway. So this is a deal where it's like you send out Nick Ritchie makes 2.5 and then you're bringing in Dezingle and Libushkin who together make 2.4 million. So it's like a real dollar in dollar out scenario, but cap wise it is not. And that's kind of where the Maple Leafs are able to flex those financial muscles, I guess, because they're able to do this. Um, so they're able to bury that contract in the minors. And so he's going to go down uh, through the waiver process. I guess he's going to have to clear first. And then he just becomes straight up depth. And he replaces Nick Ritchie as that in case injuries pop up. We have a winger to bring up. Also somebody who can play down on the Marlies, who's a good veteran for the young pieces there. So that's what you got in Ryan Dezingle. Is there anything you wanted to add uh, to the Dezingle acquisition there? Well, I mean, yeah, that... I was curious of what they were going to do with him because 
he's a guy that hasn't looked the same since he got, went to Arizona. I think mm-hmm. just plainly the the team he's playing on and the style maybe doesn't didn't exactly work to his, what he does. You know, we all remember the goal scorer from Ottawa who was a big pickup for the Columbus Blue Jackets in that uh, Matt Duchesne trade a few years ago. And it just seems like since then he hasn't been the same player. Although the last time I saw Dezingo play was against the Leafs and he was a Leaf killer in that game. So, um, but uh, yeah, I was curious about that one. I I mean, we know the main reason was because of the cap implications, but I thought there's worse players you can get than Ryan Dezingo. And I would probably take, playing Ryan Dezingo in the lineup right now over Nick Ritchie because one is capable of playing in the NHL and one didn't really seem to be the, I you know he just fa- fell out of favor with. I, I think, I think Ritchie's capable of playing in the NHL, just not on a cap team like Toronto that just can't afford to have that high of a cap. I think you yeah. look at Arizona, they're able to fit that two and a half million dollar cap hit on the fourth line. Like Nick Ritchie is an NHL or, just not for a team who needs to utilize that cap space more efficiently. That's the issue. And that's why Arizona had interest. It's like, okay, we still have, we're like, Arizona is still getting a player who's 25, 26 years old. And, you know, there may be something there, but he's at least an NHL body. Plus, this is a team that's going to be in, um, <laughs> playing in a 5,000 arena stadium next year in Arizona State University. You know how hard it's going to be to try and recruit players to go and play in a 5,000-seat arena at a college? I mean, so you're getting Nick Ritchie, who's already under contract. You don't have to worry about trying to recruit one more NHL body. There's one right there. So I I, I think that that's somewhat also appealing for Arizona and why it kind of worked, why they may have wanted Nick Ritchie. Duba said that there was a lot of interest in Ritchie. There was a few teams that were calling, but Arizona may be the only one that was willing to give up actual assets and the only ones who weren't, who weren't requesting to also um, uh, retain any salary in the deal as well, as long as they took on the Ryan Dezingle and it was kind of a real dollar in dollar out scenario. So that's, that's how I feel about the Nick Ritchie thing. But the real piece that the Maple Leafs are getting back here is Ilya Labushkin. Um, a def- he's a 27 year old defenseman, six foot two, 210 pounds, uh, he's played in 46 games this season. He's got 180 career games in the NHL, played many years of pro hockey in the KHL beforehand. This is a, a through and through defensive defenseman though. So that, that is something that, you know, the, the Maple Leafs I think we're hoping to get is somebody who you can play in your own zone. It's interesting. I don't know where he's going to end up, but he, I, I, he's probably more of a, a six, seven type of guy, uh, just based on what he is. Um, I took a look at his metrics. So just looking at Labushkin and keep in mind that he plays for the Arizona Coyotes, which let's be honest, Dave, this is not, uh, you know, this ain't the, the O2 Red Wings over there. You know what I mean? So uh, when you look at him though, he's a depth defenseman who's reliable in the D zone, possesses no offensive ability whatsoever. He'll battle for some pucks in the corners. Last season, he won 55% of his battles, which sit 96th percentile in the league and uh, was, or he was 96th in puck battles, one per 60. He was 74th percentile in zone entries, something that I think the Maple Leafs need to do a lot better. You look at the game the other night against St. Louis, you know, they entered the zone with ease and scored a lot off the rush. So you get a guy who's pretty good at breaking up zone entries. Maybe that's why Labushkin was a little bit more of an attractive piece to the Maple Leafs and to Toronto. Um, you take a look at at how incredibly reliable that he is in his own end with the puck. He's in the 99th percentile, Dave. The 99th percentile in defensive zone turnovers. What's the one thing that has really cost this team all year? I mean, it's exactly, yeah, that's exactly the, the move they, they needed. Like, really, if you think about all the issues the Leafs have had and everything you just said there, like, it it just see, it just screamed like a perfect match. It did. And now the, the question is, so where is he going to fit into this lineup is, is kind of going to be the next question. So he spent the last couple of seasons alongside Chikrin and OEL, two guys who are puck-moving defensemen. So 
that's what he's used to. He's used to being the defensive stalwart of the pair, but he's not going to move the puck for you. He's not going to do a lot of outlet passes and stretch passes, and he's not going to carry it out of the zone. So you got to – he's – in the past, they've paired him up with somebody who has been able to do that. So automatically, I think you look to Rasmus Sandin as that player who's somebody who's comfortable moving the puck out. So maybe that's where he ends up in the third pair. But then also, if you're looking at a guy who's so reliable in his own zone and, you know, will go in those board battles and battle and, and you know, a guy who hits a lot and block shots, I don't know, maybe somebody who you could also give a shot to and maybe him and Muzzin could just be a straight up D zone shutdown defensive duo that you hope that Justin Hall would be. I don't know if Labushkin's as good enough to do that. You know, it, it's interesting. It's just weird to look at him in Arizona and then translate that to what it'll be like playing with, with a much better team. But if you do look at his expected goals against per 60, it's 2.14, which is actually 17th in the NHL. 17th amongst all defensemen with at least 500 minutes played this year in expected goals against per 60, with a majority of those starts being uh, offensive zone starts. So, I like – or defensive zone start, sorry. So I like the move. Uh, I like the roll of the dice. You know, you move out Nick Ritchie, who has a $2.5 million cap this year and next year. So you get that flexibility next season because both these guys are pending UFAs. And you actually get a, real, a piece that is usable. And we'll get into this in a, in a moment. But you actually gain cap flexibility while doing it. It's quite genius by Kyle Dubas. Yeah. yeah. And, and look, uh, there was a, a, an Arizona fan that commented. Um, I saw it on Twitter. He basically said that because of who um, I always, I, I'm going to screw his name up. Right. Like uh it's like where he was playing in Arizona. didn't allow for him to really be an offensive guy either. They mm. believe that he has a little more offensive upside than what he's shown, which could you know- be possible. It could be possible. You know who else they said the same thing about when they brought him in? David Camp. Same oh. exact thing was said about David Camp, right? Chicago, because we all looked at his numbers. What's that? When they asked David Camp why he feels he's scoring more, he's like, well, I felt like in Chicago we didn't have the puck that much, and that's not right. what's happening here. Right, exactly. And, and you know, when he signed – you just looked at the bare bones stats like, oh, I scored one goal last year. This is a guy we're paying one and a half million dollars to come in and be a third line center. And then you look and you watch him play and it's like, okay, he does have a little bit more to him when he's put in the right situation. So maybe that's the, the situation here with Labushkin. That potentially could be the case where if he does end up taking on a, a bit of a larger role or with a better team, um, you know, with better players, more of a team defensive efforts, maybe that allows him to take a little bit more risks um, but at the end of the day, he's a, he's a really good shot suppressor and plays extremely re- reliable in his own end. Michael Bunting was asked about him. Bunting obviously played with him last season in Arizona. And he said, uh, quote, Bush is a great guy off the ice, uh, on the ice. He works hard every single night. He's willing to block shots and put his body on the line, plays hard out there. Great addition for us. I'm really excited to have him over here. Uh, I guess he's known as the Russian bear. So the Russian bear is his nickname which is interesting. Uh, he's just the big boy and plays a rough out there. He's not afraid to be physical at all. And that's what the Leafs have been waiting for, a physical right shot defenseman. I don't necessarily think this is it, right? I don't think that you look at this Libushkin is like, okay, that's it. You know, like that's the Ben Schrott, that's the Josh Manson. Libushkin's not that. I don't think he's necessarily puts an end to the, the, the need to address the top four in the blue line but it's a really solid depth addition that gives this team options and also allows them to maybe move on from one of those guys like a Justin Hall or like a Travis Dermott and not feel like they're hindering their team's depth by adding to the position or adding to the top four. Yeah. I think that's really the big one there is that, you know, you're getting a guy that's going to clearly play. He's going to be in that, maybe that third pairing. And then you have, you have some flexibility, you know, if you just, if, the team needs like a Justin Hall, or if the Leafs feel that they need to move a Justin Hall to make that upgrade in the you know in the top four, they can do it because now they have another right shot capable defenseman. Exactly, provides something different uh, as to what they have. 
also with the salary thing, if let's say the Zingle does clear waivers or he gets picked up, now the Leafs have just picked up one point one million dollars in cap space. I mean, right now Rasmus Sandin is well, that cap is fully variable, so it doesn't yeah. even matter the, the, yeah, the Zingle the, cap. So at this point, like they'll be able to avoid the situation where Sandin or Lilligren can't play because that's really what's been happening right now because of all the cap, uh, you know, gymnastics they've had to go through. Yeah. yeah. We'll like, get to the cap. We'll get, we'll get to the cap in a moment, but just overall, I, I think this is a really good deal. You, you move on from Richie, you create so much more roster and cap flexibility, and you actually get pieces that you can use that may help this team going forward. So all in all, I think this is uh, a, a real solid deal. It doesn't address the main need, which is a top four defenseman, but it does address the depth forward position and depth defenseman position. And you look at the Tampa Bay Lightning last couple of years, they've needed to roll through nine different defensemen through their Stanley Cup journey. So you're going to need more than just those six guys. And you add in Ilya Labushkin. Is he going to play every night? I'm not sure. Maybe he will. Maybe he won't. We'll see what ends up happening. Do they like him over Hall? Do they like him over Lilligren? Do they like him over Dermott? I guess it remains to be seen. Um, but regardless, I think they're going to give him an opportunity. And we'll see what he can run with it. But so far, the numbers look pretty good. You know, just a straight up, uh, you know, rugged, hard nose, puck battling, you know, he'll go in, he'll bang, bang the body, crash the glass and, uh, you know, play really reliable in his own zone. So that's that's what you're getting in Ilya Labushkin. Uh, why don't we take a, a, a break here? And then when we come back, let's get to the salary cap ramifications and why that portion of this deal um, makes this even even sweeter from a Maple Leafs perspective. And we'll do that afterward from our show sponsor and today's first sponsor. Built Bar. Tell us about it, Dave. Oh, our good friends at Built Bar, the low calorie, high protein candy bar that you can replace any of your candy bars with. They come in various flavors like mint, brownie, coconut, coconut almond, and new for this month, white chocolate cookies and cream. Mm, they're all delicious, and new flavors are coming out all the time. So if you are looking for a new candy bar, I suggest you go and get uh, Built Bar. And if you do plan on doing that, you can go to built.com, use the promo code LOCKED15 and get 15% off your order. So that's promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at built.com. Welcome back into the Locked on Lease podcast. Uh, I'm Mike DiStefano. He's Dave Morissuti, the host of the show. Just a reminder, you can find it wherever you find your podcast from. And we're also on YouTube now. You can check out uh, our, our ugly mugs while we sit here and we talk Leafs. Dave, time for the awkward wave to our YouTube friends. If you want to see the awkward wave, you're going to have to go check it out on YouTube. Locked on Leafs is where you can find that. Uh, we're going to keep breaking down this trade between the Maple Leafs and the Arizona Coyotes. Toronto receiving Ilya Labushkin and Ryan Dezingle in exchange for Nick Ritchie and a conditional 2023 third round pick, which they could choose to move to a 2025 second round pick. They'll have uh, they'll have to make that decision in I guess during the 2023 draft. So we won't really know for quite some time what exactly draft pick they will uh, they will decide to take. But besides the actual you know on ice value of of this deal, right? Subtracting the the contract of Nick Ritchie and adding in Labushkin, an actual player, there, there's plenty of positive cap ramifications that comes from this deal. So bear with me here. I got a little bit of, of some math and whatnot to kind of go through and help uh, educate the listeners, I guess, and, and try and make it understandable, I suppose. Cause you know, not everybody's so, uh, you know, affluent when it comes to understanding the salary cap and whatnot. So Nick Ritchie was making $2.25 million this season and next. So when he was on the roster, his cap hit was a full, was, was that full, uh, two and a half million, sorry, two and a half million dollars. So when he was buried in the minors, he was accounting for 1.375 million against the main cap because only a maximum of 1.125 is allowed to be buried in the minors. So um, despite not having Nick Ritchie on in the uh, on the main roster, he still had a cap hit on this team for 1.375 million that it was just taking up dead weight, dead space. So when you look at that, that's now gone. 
and it's been replaced with Ilya Labushkin, who makes $1.3 million. So you've actually gained $75,000, and you actually have a player in your lineup that you can use on a nightly basis. So there's one thing. And then Ryan Dezingle, who makes $1.1 million, that contract is fully buryable because it's underneath the $1.125 that you're allowed to bury in the minors. And he's already been placed on waivers, and he'll report and hopefully clears. And he fills in that Nick Ritchie spot on the main roster as depth and then also can be just the top six, top nine guy, um, veteran player for the Marlies. And then we look at Labushkin. I already talked about it. At only $1.3 million, you're saving $75 of cap, and you actually get a real player, tangible player that you can throw out there on any given night. It also allows them to accrue that $75,000 of cap space each day up until the trade deadline. I don't know how that math works. It's just they're going to somehow have more cap space by the deadline by having an additional $75,000 freed up in daily cap leading up to the deadline. I don't know exactly how much, but, you know, that they were going to accrue more cap space. So, you know, all while, so they're saving money this season, accruing more cap space, Saving money next season, allowing you to put a little bit more money because you're going to have to sign. Sandine's got a contract extension. Uh, obviously, Jack Campbell's got a contract extension. Maybe Dermot's got a contract extension. You got to figure out what you want to do with Andre Kasha. Like, there's a bunch of things that the Leafs are going to have to do over the offseason. And there's no, it's a flat cap world. So you opened up two and a half million bucks on your cap next season. Great, fantastic. All while improving their defensive and forward depth at a cheaper cost. I, I will make one quick correction to that. Uh, Travis Dermott is signed for next season. At one did point. I say Dermott? I don't think I said, did I say Dermott? I, I think I heard you say Dermott. Dermott needs an extension. I, I heard someone. Sandine. There. I meant Sandine and Lilligren. Yeah. There was one more in there. I thought I heard Dermott's name in there. Otherwise, I'm not being a good co-host and not listening. <laughs> but I thought I heard Dermott's name in there. If I said Dermott, I did not mean Dermott. But, but yeah, yeah like, Sandine, Lilligren. Campbell, Kasha, they all need extensions. Yeah, the, they have a lot of lot of decisions they'll have to make. You know, we we talked about this on the last podcast when it came to like Jack Campbell. Like, we know that the Leafs are going to have to make room for that type of deal because he's not going to make what he is making now. He's going to make probably upwards of let's say five million as the starting point. The Leafs don't have five million in space really to work with. Now they've cleared up, to, you know, the two point five for next year. They can move some guys to make that work. Um, but yeah, this was, I think, the hardest contract. I mean, I thought it was going to be the hardest contract to move. Lo and behold, it actually proved to not be as hard to move as I thought. Right. I think the best part is that they didn't have to retain any salary. Yes, I was a little yeah. concerned about that one, but I feel like so many teams, like Arizona. It's a blessing to to a lot of teams in the league, but I'm sure the NHL is also like, you know, it'd be nice if you guys were not doing this all the time. But I think I think it's just the way that GMs are now pretty much saying the salary cap is a pain, but we found ways now to get around it. I like I was saying earlier though, I think Arizona actually sees a tangible value in Nick Ritchie because of the additional year on his contract. Like, I, I don't know about you, Dave, but if you have to decide between signing in, let's say, Los Angeles, where, you know, they're a decent squad, you know, you're going to have full NHL amenities and facilities, or you're going to have to go and sign in Arizona, where they'll only have a 5,000 seat arena with very subpar facilities and, and, you know, barely NHL level facilities at Arizona State University Hockey. I, I mean, that's going to be a tough sell. So that's just one more body, NHL quality level body that you don't have to worry about. And it allows them to get closer to the cap floor at the end of the day. They've got so many guys who are coming up for uh, that are going to be UFAs after this season. So they don't have many NHL players signed contracts next year. They only have like a handful of them. So I could see them being interested and in literally seeing value in that where other teams don't really have that issue and that value is not there right what's the the saying the beauty is in the eye of the beholder one man's trash is another man's treasure that's the situation here with the nick ritchie and the arizona coyotes you know they see 
an actual tangible value to Nick Ritchie and to that, you know, enormous contract this year and next. And the Maple Leafs were like, okay, well then let's make a deal because we see some value in some of your guys. Let's make a swap. And I think it works out. I think it works out in favor of Toronto, but Arizona, it, it works out for their favor in a different capacity. So I think both squads are quite happy with it. Um, let's take one more quick break. When we get back, I actually have a quote from Kyle Dubas. His he his thoughts on the deal. I'll explain that. And then we could also discuss maybe what's next. You know, what's what's coming down the pike here? Because I, I would be hard-pressed to think that Labushkin is the main ad for the deadline here for the Maple Leafs. So we'll get to all that and more. But first, uh, why don't we hear from uh, today's show sponsor, and that's betonline.net. Uh, BetOnline remains – sorry, football might be over this season, but basketball is in full steam ahead. And now I'm having a difficult time opening up this thing here. What's going on? Oh, one second, Dave. Football might be over this season, but basketball is in full steam for both pro and college hoops. From all the latest odds, totals, player performance props, to where the next coach is going to land, BetOnline.net is the number one spot for all your sports betting needs. BetOnline remains the best spot for all your sports scores, podcasts, and news this season. And it's not just basketball. BetOnline.net is your source for hockey, boxing, and UFC odds right to the Olympic coverage and information. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in action. Bet online, it's where the game starts. Welcome back into the Locked On Lease podcast. Mike DiStefano here alongside me. I've got Dave Morissuti, and we're still breaking down this uh, trade between the Arizona Coyotes and the Toronto Maple Leafs. Nick Ritchie out, Ilya Labushkin, and Ryan Dezingle in for Toronto. Um, so here's that quote that I was referring to. This is... Uh, Kyle Dubas, I guess, was speaking today after the deal, and this is what he had to say on the trade. Uh, the decision was with Nick. It wasn't going to be the end of the world for us to keep him and have him as our own depth. Basically, the purpose that we hope Dezingle will now serve if that works out. So what we're trying to do in the end was to make a good deal for us where we could add something where both teams would come out of it with what they wanted. There were a number of other teams that were interested in Richie, but they would have involved retention or other teams or other items that we just weren't interested in. Arizona had the cap space, and then they also had a couple of players that we were interested in, and we were able to meet their objectives in the deal as well. So for us, we didn't really focus on anything else because uh, this was one that we honed in on, feeling that with Labushkin and Dezingle, it met some of our own internal objectives. So that was Kyle Dubas's thoughts on the deal. Which makes a lot of sense. Oh, it definitely mm -hmm. does. Like, you know, the, I think the last thing you'd want to see is just trying to get rid of Nick Ritchie and a draft pick for basically nothing. Like, if yeah. you, like the, the thing that makes this a massive win for these is that you can see at least Labouche can playing a role. And even if the Zingle plays or not, like it, it just serves such a purpose for, and you even mentioned the Arizona side. This is just not just a throwaway trade that they were just trying to, you know, move off of Nick Ritchie and be done with it. Like we remember the Patrick Marlowe, you know, movie Patrick right. Marlo and a first round pick just to get rid of his salary. And a lot of people did not like that because you gave up a first round pick. So at least I, I think this is maybe the Leafs realizing how to kind of fix their, you know, mistakes because really you would, count the, the Richie deal as a mistake based on yeah. how that's, that's exactly what this was. And when you compare the two deals, Toronto didn't really get better when they gave away a first round pick to get rid of Marlowe's deal, but they get better by giving up a pick to move out Nick Richie by also bringing in Ilya Labushkin. Like the team I think is better on paper today than they were yeah. two or three days ago. Right. So you know, that, that's another way to look at uh, at this deal. Um, something else that Kyle Dubas said on uh, Ilya Labushkin, he said, uh, he's kind of gone under the radar in Arizona that uh, we thought, yeah, that we thought compared to the market on the other types of guys that it would be good for us. So not that rosy of a quote, but I'm sure some other quotes will start to kind of falter out uh, or filter out here in the next little bit. Um, 
and maybe we can touch on them a little bit more in tomorrow's podcast. But I think the next question is here, Dave, is what's next, right? So they they they've made the move. They've gotten rid of Nick Ritchie's deal. They've brought in the depth forward. They brought in a depth defenseman, and they've also opened up an additional seventy five thousand in salary cap space, um, in which they can use to accrue money, additional salary cap space between now and the deadline. Got to think that's for a reason. That's tactical. That's strategical. What's next? What do you think? Well, and here, yeah, that's well. First, you got to see what happens with, with the zingle. Does he clear? Well, if he what what happens? I don't with think it matters. Like, I really don't think it matters. If he clears, he goes to the minors. If he doesn't clear, whatever. Like, well, basically, I know that Bushkin is not going to be with the team until Tuesday in, in Columbus. Right. So we're not going. You're not going to see him against the Habs. So, um, what what I think here is that you're gonna you're gonna get more time now to see how the Bushkin fits in, and then you're still, I think, assessing what you have with Rises Sandine and Timothy Lilligren because Timothy Lilligren has been playing with Jake Muzzin on that second pairing. I think they're trying to give that some real hard, you know, a real look because I think they're going to try to determine, okay, how much of a, how much of a play do we make for that top four defenseman? Cause I think really, if you're looking at what the Leafs need to do, I think that's, that's still the biggest one. I, I think needs to be checked off and it's going to be tough because you know, the guys that they're looking at have a lot of interest and some people have brought up Claude Giroux's name for the Leafs as well. And yeah. I would, I would, I like a Claude Giroux on the Leafs. Claude Giroux would be good on the Leafs, but at what cost and how would you make that work? And first off, will Claude Giroux even want to leave? Right. Cause you also have to think of a player that hasn't really voiced his desire to be traded. So that's always something I think that teams have to weigh when they look at those deals. So I still think that top four defenseman is uh, it's something that the Leafs uh, will need to really focus on between now and the deadline. The good thing is that you almost have just under a month to really assess where the team is now. Now that you brought in another kind of another thing that shakes up the roster. Question. Do you like when you see what happened this season with the LA Rams when they pushed all their chips into the table and finally got it done? Do you think that maybe if you're Kyle Dubas, you see that works? You go, you know what? Maybe we go full LA Rams here, sacrifice picks and prospects and the betterment of the future to try and put this team over the hump and get it done. You could you see this year kind of being that type of season where you know nothing is untouchable in terms of futures pieces to land the fish that they're looking to get to land the guy who they think could put them over the top. I, I think that you're most likely going to be doing that because you're not making all these moves just to, you know, teeter around the edge. You're kind of, they're in a win now mode. Like they've been in a win now mode for the last how many years. Right. Yeah. So it's, it's almost like, I don't want the least to be like the Oilers where they're like, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to contend but we're not willing to do what it takes to contend, right? Because if you're not willing to do it, the teams that are you are going up against are willing to do it. Tampa Bay, Florida, they're always willing. Like Tampa Bay has traded how many of their not only first round picks, but guys they have taken early in the draft to yep. improve the team, to improve their chances. Because the guys that they have there now aren't going to be there forever. So like you can build to the future, but the future, what's the future really going to be? considering your best players are here right now. Yeah. Right? That's how I kind of view the whole field with the LA Rams. Like the guys that are there, they're there now. They're not there in 10 years, five to 10 years. So I think that's why, you know, Kyle Dubas definitely doesn't want to put an expiry date on, on this run, but he also has to think that it's not going to last forever. No clocks, clocks ticking and the flat cap really, I think boosted that all up. Right. Like, this team, this iteration of the team is not going to be the same next year as, as it is this season. It may not be better. I don't know. Maybe it will be, but maybe it won't be. You know, we already talked about the fact that they got to make sure that they get Jack signed. 
You know, Andre Kosh has turned out to be a tremendous depth piece for the squad and kind of go up and down the lineup, plays really good, you know, some solid penalty kill minutes as well. Also on PP2, you know, you have, uh, you know, Sandine, who's going to need a contract extension the way he's playing. He'll be due for for a little bit of a raise. I don't expect him to be too, too much. But when you don't really have the salary cap going up, you already got to factor in Morgan Riley's raise that's going to be put into the situation next year. You just don't know where, you know, improvements could be made on this team. And this might be their biggest and best shot to get it done. So in my estimation, you're Kyle Dubas. You got to make a big move here. I, I think, you know, another first round exit is a lost job for someone, whether it's him or it's Shani or it's 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 Sheldon Keefe. Maybe that's the end of the core four. You know, you can't take those picks and prospects with you if you're fired. So, I mean, I think Dubas is going to push his chips into the table and try and, and make a real run for it this season and make a big, sizable deal. Um, one more quote quickly before we wrap things up here. I uh, saw this one just kind of circulating now. Uh, this is Kyle Dubas on what made Ilya Labushkin attractive to the Leafs. So, this is a quote from Kyle Dubas himself. We don't have a lot of guys that have his utility. Obviously, a big, strong, right-shot defenseman. Strong, right-shot defenseman. Strong defensively. Able to kill penalties and play with a little bit more physicality than we may have. He's kind of gone under the radar in Arizona, and we thought that. Uh, compared to the market on the other types of guys, that it was a good bet for us. And uh, get him working with our coaching staff and work with our development staff and see if we can continue to build on the job that Arizona did with him which was to bring him over from Russia. It did a very good job at getting him to this point, playing him more this year and playing against better players this year and doing so fairly well. He probably just doesn't fit their timeline as a UFA in Arizona. So that's what he had to say. And that kind of goes back to what we're talking about, how you know it was a similar situation with David Camp, how they figured, you know what, they've done a good job of acclimating this European player into the NHL but we can kind of allow him to take that next step. We think the tools are there. And if we just give him the proper mentoring and the proper nurturing, maybe we, we, we could turn him into something here over the next little bit. And it turns into a, a better situation for Libushkin, for the Maple Leafs and, you know, Arizona, I guess they're happy because they've got Nick Ritchie. <laughs> I know, you know, Leaf fans may look at that and be like, hey, draft you know. that they can use for other deals. Like, and they got a draft pick as well. You're right. A draft pick, either a third in 2023 next season or a second in 2025. The interesting part is they didn't have to give away a draft pick this year. So they still have their first and second round pick this season to go out and make one of those bigger deals. And those bullets that Dubas talked about earlier this season, the one bullet in the chamber, they're still there. Right? Those draft picks are still there for uh, for the Leafs and Kyle Dubas to make a bigger deal. Uh, but let us know what you think of the trade. Let us know on Twitter. You can let me know at Mickey underscore Canuck. Let Dave know at D underscore Morisuti at Locked On Leafs as well. Or also comment down below here if you're on YouTube. Let us know what you think of the deal. Uh, but that's to do it for us here today on the podcast. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for subscribing and supporting the show. Uh, Make sure that you are subscribed wherever you get your podcast from to receive daily Leafs content such as this. And I mean, Dave, with the, the trade deadline right around the corner, there's going to be so much more speculation and actual deals going down. You're not going to want to miss a single episode each and every day from Monday to Friday. So make sure that you are subscribed to Locked on Leafs. Um, I'll be back. We will be back with another episode tomorrow. We'll kind of go over the game against Montreal as well and tee up what's going on in Columbus, which could be Labushkin's Maple Leafs debut. Looking forward to it. We'll chat with you guys again on Tuesday. But until then, keep it locked right here on Locked on Leafs.